You know, when we live in a sinful world, the truth is that selfish people can hurt you. Um, you don't always have Mr. Miyagi to back you up. Uh, but I'm going to give you three things that happened today. But let me read this verse from 1 Peter 4.13 to kind of give you the context of where we're headed today with this passage in Mark. But be happy. This is from the New Century Version. By the way, New Century Version, great translation for those who struggle with reading. Uh, sixth grade reading level. And most of America, sixth grade reading level, if you didn't know that. Here we go. But be happy that you are sharing in Christ's sufferings so that you will be happy and full of joy when Christ comes again in glory. The truth is, as a believer, there will be times that you suffer because you're a believer, and there's times that you suffer because you live in a fallen world. That is not just spiritual suffering. That is also emotional suffering sometimes, and even physical suffering sometimes. I read where uh, there was a pastor who said, you know, because of Christ's death, we do not suffer sickness. Well, Lazarus uh, had more faith than any of us, and he is not here today. He died of something. And so at some point in a fallen world, you and I, on our worst day, where we're as sick as we can be, we'll say, I'm so sick, I feel like I'm going to... Hi, Jesus. You know, our worst day and our best day are the same. So last week, Jesus was praying not to go through suffering because he's fully human and fully God. He experienced all the emotions that we experience, like Rodney talked about. By the way, uh, uh, Rodney Walker is at First Baptist Church of Rockledge as an interim pastor today. You guys have done that, helped send somebody out to do that, and we're so appreciative for him. He actually uh, did the message focus uh, last night, and then Rodney Phillips did the message focus this morning and did a great job. And then uh, Steve McCrory will be doing the message focus next service and done a great job. We continue to see people uh, rising up to bless other people, and that's what we want to do at our church, continue to do that. By the way, I talked to Robin, who's leading our grief share, and that group continues to grow and help people. So you're just doing some great things. When I was about nine years old, if you didn't know, my dad was a contractor and he did not believe in child labor laws. And so when I was nine years old, I, uh, uh, my dad uh, had a painter uh, that he wanted to paint some louvered doors. And this painter had worked for my dad before, a great painter, but he did not like to sand. So my dad said, no problem. I will give you my nine-year-old son as an indentured servant. And so there I went in one of my dad's houses to work as an indentured servant for a chain smoking great painter smoked like this i mean one after the other after the other the whole house smelled like menthol cigarettes and he would come in and he would say okay so first he wanted to show me I, and i had sanded stuff before and have you ever seen sandpaper? This is a full sheet. This is a full sheet. By the way, you can buy it in partial sheets and pay a lot more money. So one of the first things he taught me was how to fold a piece of sandpaper and, and put it on a sharp edge and be able to cut it. Have any of you ever cut sandpaper that way? Okay, if not, there you go. And you don't have to use scissors. It's not good for your scissors. And, uh, and he actually taught me to do that. And back then, I think I actually did it in four pieces. Now I'm too lazy, so I just do it in half. And then I began sanding each and every louver of a closet door. The old closet doors that had louvers top to bottom in every room. And he would come in and he would expect what I do and say, I think you're doing pretty good there. Uh, it's pretty good. And I think it was right before. Uh, uh, by the way, drinking on the job was not outlawed for construction back then. And uh, so I'm not sure how much he knew even where I was by the end of the day. But at nine years old, I learned that sandpaper can make rough things smooth. Now, here's what I want you to know. God will use circumstances and difficulties in your life as sandpaper to change you. And there are many unfair things that happened in this world. You are not in a world that is full of grace. You're in a world that's full of sin. And so people are sinners and they're broken. Our very DNA is broken with the fall of man. There are times our own DNA betrays us with sickness or cancer. And God will even use in a sinful world the sins of others and the hurts of this world in order to make us more useful to him. Now I'll tell you something that I know about God too is sometimes we're stubborn. 
And so instead of sandpaper, there are times he will get the chisel out to chisel those rough areas off of us, those areas where we need humbling, where we need correction, where we need patience. I don't like that one at all. And the difficulty for us is none of us like this. You know, the Bible talks about how God is a refining fire. And it talks about his refining fire changing us and molding us. And, and I say to God, God, I don't want refiner's fire. I want refiner's jacuzzi. You know, nice, warm, just hot enough, but don't really change me. But God says, if you want to be used by me, I will allow things in your life and I will use those very things. Things that sometimes just happen because of life in a sinful world, but I can use all of them, good or bad, to shape you into my vessel. So God never wastes a hurt. If there's a hurt in your life and a difficulty in your life and an area of suffering in your life, God can use that very area in you for other people as much as he used Jesus. That's why the Bible talks about entering his sufferings so that he can use us. There's no shortcuts with God. I want you to know that God is preparing to use you in great ways. When you choose to be obedient to God, there'll be times that you still will suffer. It's not fair when you're falsely accused. It's not fair when friends leave. And it's not fair when you suffer because of selfish people. But God used that very suffering in Jesus' life. And he'll use your suffering for the good. So let's start with, we understand the suffering of Christ when we see these three things. Number one, we understand the sufferings of Christ when we're falsely accused. We're picking up in Mark chapter 14. Now, I said that I was going to do a chapter at a time, and I did that until I got here, and I just couldn't. So we had to go back to chapter 14 this week, kind of finish it up. We'll get 15. We will be done with this entire book of Mark in about two weeks. Then some stood up and gave false testimony against him, talking about Jesus. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days will build another not made with hands. How did they do that? They took two different things Jesus said and put them together and said that's what he said. They lied about what he said. Yet even their testimony did not agree. Now there's two things here. Number one, Jewish law would not allow you to convict somebody if the testimony didn't agree. But Roman law was the same way. You couldn't convict somebody if two different people said two different things. It meant somebody was lying. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is the testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Time out. Let me tell you something. There are times when you're being falsely accused. By the way, almost everyone in this room at some point has been accused of something they didn't do. There are times that when you're falsely accused, yes, you need to say what's right. But there are times when you're falsely accused that you need to remain silent. Because there are times that no matter what you say to certain people, that they're just going to use it against you anyway, so why do you just keep talking? There are people that no matter what you say, they're going to call you a liar. There's people that no matter what you say or do, they will not believe you. And there are times that it's better to remain silent. Abraham Lincoln used to say, sometimes better to remain silent and have people assume you are a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. But Jesus remained silent, gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? I am, said Jesus. By the way, when he says I am, he's referring to the Old Testament where God said, I am to Moses. And you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Now you need to realize what a big deal this is. Tearing your clothes is not like you go back to Walmart and buy clothes. So this was a big deal. It showed grief or anger. They would tear their clothes. So he tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? You've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. But the Jews were not, even in their political structure, the Romans did not allow them to kill people. All they could do is send them to the next place. And we'll see that in a minute. Then some began to spit on him. They blindfolded him and struck him with their fists. Think about that. If I walked up to you and act like I was going to hit you, you would flinch. You would... You would get ready. They blindfolded him so it hurt more. And then they mocked him. 
They said, prophesy, and the guards took him and beat him. And why did the religious leaders do this? Because they were jealous of Jesus. Remember, they said, everybody's going to him. He's messing up our way of life. They didn't like him, uh, what he said about them. He called them actors. That would be like being a called a politician today. Right? If somebody came up to you and said, man, you're just like a politician, would you take that as a compliment? Probably not. If somebody said to one of your children, you're going to grow up to be a politician, you'd be like, do not curse my child, right? And this is how it was. Jesus called them hypocrites. That was never used before. He said, you're a bunch of fakers, a bunch of actors, a bunch of pretenders, and they didn't like it, but that wasn't enough. Jesus also called them whitewashed tombs. If that wasn't bad enough, he said, you're full of dead bones. Basically, there's nothing real about you, and they did not like that. And now they had him, and he was at a point of weakness. So they attacked him. There are people that will attack you when you're weak. There are people that will accuse you when you can't defend yourself. Whether it's in front of you or behind you, they will talk about you. And so what do we need to realize in that? That even in those false accusations that God is arranging our future. There are times that you're at a job and you get falsely accused and God may be moving you to the next position. I had somebody years ago say, how do you know when you're supposed to go to a new job? I said, well, uh, uh, somebody said to me one time, they said, well, a lot of times God has a pull to another job, but then sometimes there's a push. When all of a sudden you don't have a job anymore, guess what? You're going somewhere else, right? And so he arranges the future. We don't always like it. I don't know about you. Uh, uh, sometimes when you lose your job, all of a sudden that's one of these, right? It's painful, it hurts, you feel rejection, especially if you've been accused falsely. Number two, not only are we falsely accused, but our friends fail. If you get to know anyone well, they will fail you at times. Anybody, everybody. If you talk to them enough, at some point you're going to realize they don't have their act together. They can fool you for a little while, but the truth is, if they're a real person, at some point you're going to go, oh boy. If you don't learn to have grace with people, you will never have friends. Did you hear what I just said? If you don't learn to allow people to be imperfect, to allow your friends to say something and you go, well, that wasn't right. And to have grace, then you'll never have friends. Because no one has their act together. That's why we need Jesus. I had a friend call me who's a pastor. He's a pastor. And about 10 years ago, he called me. And we were talking. And he said, Eric, I just want you to know something. I will never be friends with anyone in my church. I said, what are you talking about? He said, I do not trust the people in my church. They can hurt you. I said, you're absolutely right. I said, but I feel like as a pastor, part of my job is to be vulnerable to people. And being vulnerable to people, let me tell you something about being vulnerable to people. The stories I tell, the things that I say are, are true and real stories. That also opens me up to be hurt by people. When you're real with people and honest with people, it allows them to hurt you. Jesus had opened himself up to his disciples By the way, the people often that you help the most and do the most for are the people that will hurt you the most. It's the people you care about the most are the very ones that when they fail, when they fall, when they run away, it hurts the most. Here Jesus had spent time with his disciples and listened to what happened next. Remember Peter was the one who said, I'll never leave you even if everybody else does. While Peter was below in the courtyard, verse 66... One of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You were with that Nazarene, Jesus, she said, but he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said. I went out in the entryway. Well, then he went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, Hey, this fellow's one of them. Again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, Surely you're one of them. For you are a Galilean. Now you need to realize the reason they knew he was a Galilean is because of his accent. It would be like you and I going to Boston. And you go up and you say, hey, where do I park my car? They'd say, you're not from here, are you? You'd say, no, no, I'm from Boston. 
And they'd say, well, why don't you park your car in the yard? Right? A totally different accent. And so here Peter realizes he's been busted. So what does he do? He freaks out. He began to call down curses and he swore to them, I don't know the man you're talking about. By the way, in another one of the references in Scripture, it says that Jesus looked at him about this time. Immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him before the rooster crows twice. You will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. Now here's a few reasons as a Christian that people will leave you. They will sometimes leave you because you call sin, sin. There are times that you have to say to somebody, hey, you're calling yourself a Christian, but you're doing this thing. You know, the Bible calls that sin, and that's wrong. There are people who will not want to be around you when you're honest. Now, I'm not saying you need to be a jerk about that. We need to speak the truth in love, the Bible says. But there's times that the truth is the truth. People will sometimes leave you when they can't use you anymore. People will sometimes leave you when you fail in some area. And controlling people will leave you when you don't give them everything they want. So what do we do? When friends fail, here's what we need to know. God is teaching us to rely on Him. No, listen, no matter how wonderful fr of your friends are, they are imperfect. They are not God. So there are times that they will let you down. There are things they say, they do, that are imperfect. And you can only give them grace when you understand that you rely on God. For your stability. And you're not dependent on other people for you to find your way in this world. You're dependent on Him and you bless other people on the way. Number three, so we're falsely accused, friends fail. Number three, suffering from selfish people. In Psalms 28 3, it talks about not dragging me away with the wicked. It says, who, who speak cordially with their neighbors but harbor malice in their heart. There's people around us, like that psalmist talked about, who say the right things but their intentions aren't good. So I wanted to give you a couple warnings about selfish people. Number one, here's some traits of selfish people. They manipulate people because they don't care about their needs. They're, they're just looking for self-interest. They act. They, they put on a mask because they don't want to show weakness or vulnerability. In church, it looks like this. You're in, a, you're in a small group, and they want to hear about your sins, but you'll never hear them talk about anything they've ever done wrong. They'll never admit a fault, a weakness, a character defect. They'll never admit they have bad driving, right, Rodney? A selfish person has to always be in control. They can't handle any criticism, even constructive criticism. They can't handle it. Why? Because you're telling them they're not perfect. They have to pretend to be perfect. They have to justify lying in order to make themselves look good. Sometimes that might be about something they've done. Sometimes it might just be to make themselves look better to you. They often pretend to listen to those who don't agree with them, and then will use what that person said against them. You've probably seen that at workplaces. Where a person seems to be listening, the next thing you know, they're using whatever you said against you. If you haven't been through that yet, that's a fun one. They criticize others behind their backs. Be careful of people who criticize others behind their backs, because let me tell you something, one day you'll be on their list. If you listen to somebody who criticizes people all the time, you need to, in the back of your mind, go, oh, I'm going to be on that list one day. Be very careful. And then finally, selfish people often exaggerate their achievements. They pretend to work hard when they really don't. They pretend to do things that they really haven't done. Be careful when you see those signs. Know that you might be being exposed to someone who's very selfish. Now, we don't always have a choice about who we expose ourselves to, just like in that video. Sometimes selfish people are just in our life. Sometimes they're in our family. Sometimes they're our neighbors. Sometimes they're in our workplaces. Sometimes we had nothing to do with them, and all of a sudden a selfish person does something that messes up our lives. The chief priest accused Jesus of many things, verse, uh, chapter 15, verse 3. So again, now he's before the Romans here. So again, Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer? See how many things they're accusing you of? But Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. Now, Pilate wanted to let him go. Pilate, we know, wanted to release Jesus. Pilate couldn't believe Jesus wasn't defending himself. By the way, in the Old Testament, that's true from a prophecy that he would remain silent. 
Now, it was a custom at festival at the festival to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists, listen, who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. So, of course, Pilate's assuming they mean Jesus. So he says, you want me to release the king of the Jews? Asked Pilate, knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priest had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why, what crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to him, had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Some people think that the reason he had Jesus flogged is he thought maybe when they saw Jesus beaten, they would say that was enough, but it wasn't enough. See, even though Jesus knew he was called to the cross, it was selfish, self-centered people that God allowed to change to, to do what needed to be done in order for us to have a Savior. And in your life, even when a selfish person does something and you can say, that is not fair, that's not right, I've been dealt a bad hand in life, I should have had this, that person did that. And let me tell you something. One of the reasons you need to forgive people who've hurt you in the past is because even that hurt, even that wrong hurt, even that wrong sandpaper, if you allow God to give you forgiveness. He will use that so that you can use that very pain to help someone else. So that you can use the very pain that happened in your life, that terrible tragedy, that terrible thing that happened, that suffering that happened in your life, He can use that very thing to help you to push somebody to Jesus. Why? Because when selfish people affect us, we long for heaven's perfection. And when you go through life and you long for heaven's perfection, here's what happens. You don't focus on the problems of this world because you realize that this world will always have problems. Your best day on earth will be your worst day in heaven. The day that you were the happiest, the day that all of life came together and you heard birds singing and everything was joyous and wonderful is just a touch of heaven. And so there's got to be a dissatisfaction in us for this earth so that when people hurt us, when things happen, when we're falsely accused, we realize God must be moving me and changing me and he's, he's sandpapering my life. And by the way, I know that sometimes being falsely accused isn't sandpaper, it's a chisel. It'll remove your pride. God, that wasn't right. When your friends fail you and you learn to rely on God, you realize it's true. Just like Jesus said, Jesus didn't re, uh, release himself to him at one time, it says, because he knew men's hearts. When you get to know people, they fail sometimes. So what do you do? You love them. You care about them. You hope they do well. But sometimes, just like our own children, we go, oh, man, right? Haven't you ever looked in the mirror and done that to yourself? <laughs> like, oh, I thought I was doing so good. We fail ourselves. So what do we do? We rely on him. And when we suffer from selfish people, and you will, you're in an earth full of sin. Selfishness happens, you turn to heaven. I have a friend that just yesterday posted that yesterday was a painful anniversary. He said a few years ago, his mom and dad were on the way home from a trip. And a drunk driver, guy who left a party and didn't want to get a ride with somebody, hit them. Instantly killed his mom, the car burst into flames, and his dad, on fire, dragged himself from the car and was in the hospital for weeks. He said, I'm glad my dad's around, but I'm sad about losing my mom because of someone's selfish act. We live in a world where selfishness and self-centeredness and pain and mental illness and all of those things cause us to struggle. And in the middle of all that, even that tragedy, my prayer for you is that God would use that very thing to help you to rely on him. And then in the middle of all those things, he would use even your pain. He'd never waste a hurt. He would use even your pain to help you to be a blessing to someone else. 
Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, thank you for each one here. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here or watching online that doesn't know you, that today would be the day they surrender their heart and life to you. Knowing that the only stability, the only security in life is through you. Through surrendering our sins to you, relying on your cross, knowing you died for our sins and rose again, and that when we trust you, you give us salvation. Salvation is not found in our works. Not found in the things that we do, but it's found in you. Lord, even when we fail ourselves, you said you will never fail us. So Lord, today, I pray if anyone here needs you, that today would be the day they surrender their hearts and lives to you. And Lord, as believers, sometimes it's true we suffer. Lord, sometimes we suffer because of others, and sometimes we suffer because of our own bad choices. Sometimes we suffer just because we live in a fallen world. Lord, in the middle of all that, would you bring comfort to those who are hurting? Lord, would you bring security with those who are feeling insecure because of a hurt right now? Lord, would you bring peace to those who are feeling a lack of peace today? Father, I thank you that in the middle of suffering, you said you will never fail us and leave us. So, Lord, I pray we would know your presence. I pray for your presence in a very special way for that one that's here watching online this morning that is deeply hurting. That, Father, in the middle of their hurt, they would sense your arms just wrap around them, knowing that you've never left them. You are here. Lord, we thank you for these moments. In Jesus' name, amen.